thank God again for, for the people of God, for, for you all being here. And thank you again for, for your faithfulness. Let, let me ask you, why are you sitting here? <laughs> Can anybody tell me that? What in the world would bring you here on a rainy day, <laughs> cold, clammy morning? What in the world? Why would you sit here, probably for another hour or so, <laughs> why would you endure this experience? And perhaps for some of you it might be torturous, I, I trust not, <laughs> but... Some of you are probably asking, yeah, I've been trying to figure that out myself. Why, why do I do this? But honestly speaking, why, why, why do we do this? Giving praise to the Lord, yeah. To give, to give him the thanks, absolutely, absolutely. He's worthy, all of that is true. Jesus indeed. But let, let me ask you, let me ask you this, um, if, if I can, just, just be a little more specific. I'm after something. There, there's really ultimately only one reason. And I know, you know, if we say for God's glory, that sort of encapsulates it. But the one reason why you sit here today, yes, it is to worship. It's because of him, his spirit. Amen. He, he caused it to be. He called us. Absolutely. Absolutely. He loves us. He loves us. You, you just won't let me get this thing out, will you? <laughs> Amen. But, but, you know, it's true. It's true. It just goes on and on and on. And I think it's inexhaustible indeed. But I'm, I'm trying to distill it down to one aspect of, of all that we've said and more. There's so much more. But there, there is one, one ultimate reason why we, we gather Sunday after Sunday and why we, we attend uh, Bible studies, prayer services, why we, why we sing. There's really one reason. Now, there, there are many, many reasons. Let me, let me rephrase that. There are many reasons, but there's one ultimate reason why we can do that. And that's because there is an empty tomb. Yeah. Amen. Just, just let that wash over you. Amen. Just let that wash over you. We're, we're the tomb not empty. That's right. Even though God is worthy of glory, yeah. we, we would not be gathered right. like this. But the reason why Christians gather on the first day of the week is because Christ was raised on the first day of the week. And because there's an empty tomb, there's a reason to sing. There's a reason to gather, and the reason, the impetus to gather like this is because we serve a risen Savior, a tomb that is empty. It, it, you can't find his bones. There are no bones. That would uh, demonstrate that Christ died and was consumed, uh, or Psalm uh, 16 speaks of, of his body seeing corruption. His body wasn't in the grave long enough to be corrupted by, by the uh, deterioration of the, the physical body. He was in and out. <laughs> he just visited the place called the grave. Amen. And in fact, uh, some, some have said he borrowed the tomb. <laughs> borrowed Nicodemus's, uh, I'm sorry, uh, was it Nicodemus? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, of Arimathea. Borrowed his tomb. Wasn't going to keep it long, but just needed it for a while, a short while. We, we're here today because Christ is risen. And the Apostle Paul does for us what is absolutely essential here in 1 Corinthians 15. He acquaints us with the, the utter um, um, profound um, inescapable reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he confronts us. In fact, this entire chapter is about the resurrection of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. And it comes about, it came about because there were some questions, there were some concerns about the resurrection. 
And here in 1 Corinthians 15, he attempts to answer the questions. He attempts to respond to people who are struggling with this issue of resurrection. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm starting with verse 3, Paul says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brothers all at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether, I was, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. Your faith is also empty. Let me, let me give a uh, David Gaines translation of that verse. If Christ is not risen, then sitting in church is pointless. Do you see that in the text? <laughs> That, that, that's, that's basically what it means. Your faith is pointless. It is empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. If, in fact, the dead do not rise, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. If you are still, and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable or miserable. Seven consequences if Christ is not risen. Seven of them. And all stemming from an issue, a question as to the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and so last week, last time we were together, we were looking at the historical implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Today, I'd like to uh, do the same, not by way of the historical implications, but theological implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, by way of these seven consequences, if Christ is not risen. And it, it sort of answers the question. So what? He's risen. What does that mean? And it, it means quite a bit. Uh, it profound implications if Christ is not raised. This question comes about here in verse 12. If Christ is preached. And in fact, the word if there, um, verse 12 says, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised, that, that really could be translated as since since now, now, since Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection from the dead? That, that if is, is what they call a, a subjunctive. Um, in fact, it's a first class subjunctive, which means it's assumed true. It is assumed to be true that Christ is preached that he was raised from the dead. Now, if that be the case, how are some among you saying there is no resurrection of the dead? And, and so for, for thousands of years now, the 
Christian church has been proclaiming the message that the Apostle Paul has been preaching, did preach, or rather, for, for his uh, generation. And we've been proclaiming the same, that Christ was crucified, he was buried, and that he rose according to the scriptures. It's, it's the message, it's the purpose, it's the, the uh, sine qua non, the, the, the ultimate reason. It's, it's, it's it, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is it. It's the central theme of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, he died, but that wasn't the ultimate Goal. The ultimate goal was that he died to pay the atonement, but that he must be raised. The resurrection declares that God was satisfied in his death. Had he died and not been raised, it would indicate that the father was not satisfied. So the atonement standing alone was not sufficient for our salvation. It took the atonement, his death, but it also took the resurrection to secure our eternal salvation the the amen he did he, he did get up and we, we are, are grateful to report that to you that that uh, Christ did get up and, and Paul is having a, a problem as to why some among them are, are teaching or saying that there is no resurrection one of the reasons why there that uh, people say that there is no resurrection is because there is what I call um, uh, philosophical soup. Soup. You, you, you've made stews before, right? Beef stew, chicken noodle. Uh, we, we make soup and we put all kinds of ingredients in stews and soups. And, and there, there is a, a philosophical soup that has been, um, it's been prepared it's been being prepared for ages. And the, the philosophical soup basically is, for instance, um, we today are sitting here in what's called um, uh, post-modernism. Um, that, that's a soup. That's a soup. But they, they, it has grand implications for us because it affects our thinking. And, and much the same way these Corinthians were affected in their social climate by the soup of the day, the, the philosophical soup of the day. And back then in that day here in the Corinthian culture, that's a Greek culture. They did not believe in bodily resurrection. And in fact, what they believed in, what was called uh, dualism, and dualism is, is that the, the person, the person was made up of both spirit and body, and that the body is inconsequential, it is, it is uh, virtually like, like trash. They didn't, they didn't put value on the physical body. And so they recognized that the better part of the being, the man was person, was the spirit. And in fact, that's why some of them rejected the notion that God would become a man. Because they suggested, because of dualism, that God would never take on this kind of trashy existence. And yet, John 1.14 says what? And the word did what? Became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, that, that was the soup of the day. And, and Paul, uh, again, the people of Corinth are, are exposed to that thinking. And hence they bring the, 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 the uh, implications of that thought into the, their, their theological framework. They try to take the world's thinking and, and mix it with, with the teachings of, of, of Scripture. The same is true for us today. In fact, we, are, we, we have a huge soup going on. And in fact, back in, back in um, the 15th century, there was a period of time called the Renaissance. And the Renaissance, what they did, they, they uh, valued humanism, humanism that, that human, human um, existence was, was it. Um, and, and they tended not to believe in, in God and, and in the value of God doing stuff for us, but that man is smart. He doesn't need a God, doesn't need a cosmic savior. 
And, and so in the 15th century, this renaissance, this renewal, in fact, that's the beginning of, of uh, the, the beginning of the modern era started with the Renaissance and then the, the period, the age of enlightenment comes along where they, they add to the soup. Yes. They add to the soup that man has the ability to reason, yes. think his way out of anything. Man is smart. Yes. He, he's enlightened and all of that's in the soup. And, and uh, now, now this, this is incredible. Um, because what, what is true, the scripture was read this morning about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, man, man can't reason with what he cannot see. He cannot explain supernatural. See, um, the enlightenment is based on, on natural, natural uh, phenomena. They see it, they hear it, they touch it, they taste it, they feel it, they smell it. And, and that's the extent of their existence. But things that are supra or outside of the realm of feeling, touch, taste, smell, and hearing, there's no way to measure that. How do you put, how do you put spirit under a microscope? How do, you, how, how, do you put, how do you put a resurrection? How do you, how do you explain resurrection? <laughs> how, how does a scientist begin to explain a resurrection. See, there, there, there's no way. There's no way. There, there, there's, where do you go? Where, where, where's the first place you go? See, we, we rather than um, rely on reason, what we as believers do, we realize that reason has limitations. I, and I would add severe limitations when it comes to the spiritual. That, that reason does not reveal God. In order for us to understand God with our reason, God must first reveal himself to us. Amen. But Job, Job wrestled with this. Job said, Job said, when I, I sought God, I looked to my left, he was, I looked to my right, I, I was after him, I could not find him. And the reason why we struggle in our pursuit of God is because we, we rely too often on our reason and not depending enough upon revelation. God has revealed himself. And, and so in the enlightenment, they, they just felt like if, if we couldn't see it, touch it, taste it, smell it, and examine it, um, those things are, are not of any value. And then the, the um, late 19th century and 20th century, we moved into modernism. And in modernism, again, uh, modernism is a, 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 a non-theistic. They, they don't believe in God. See, that's now added in the soup. Now, now they've gotten bold enough, whereas at least in humanism, and um, in the Enlightenment period, they would, they would accept perhaps the, the reality of, of uh, perhaps some kind of being out there. But now in modernism, in this soup now, they absolutely are, are dogmatic about it. There is no God. Get over it. Grow up. And, and so they, they, there's this huge push um, in modernism to extract um, thoughts of God, thoughts of supernatural things from, from our, our, our culture. And uh, we're living also now in, in this late 20th century, 21st century, we're in what's called postmodernism. And postmodernism now has moved into this place where um, not, not only is there no God, but there are no, there's no such thing as, as truth, absolute truth. Um, here, here we are, and, and see, now that's fine and dandy, you know, for them. But see, the problem with Paul and the Corinthians is that the Corinthians, some of the Corinthians were eating the soup. How say some of them among you that there is no res resurrection? Well, they, they were eating the soup. Contrary to what Paul is preaching, they're imbibing on on. on on these these uh, these principles of of the soup, you you remember, um, uh, man, I can't even remember how many years ago, but um, uh, a number of years ago, Jim Jones yes, sir. Uh, led led nine hundred. 
people. Uh, was it to Ghana? And uh, Guyana? Guyana? Uh huh. And, and uh, he, he had a, a nice libation created for them. And Kool Aid. And beware the Kool Aid. And, and see, the thing is, they, they drank the Kool Aid, they believed him. And, and I, I just want to borrow that concept that so many of us in, within Christianity are, are drinking the Kool-Aid, eating the soup, um, and, and are, are struggling with embracing this concept of, of the resurrection. And I, I, let, me, let me hasten to say as well, particularly for our, our young people, um, our, our young people are faced with these these what, one, two, three, four, four ages um, of soup that's been prepared for them. And, and guess what? In our universities, they're getting the soup. Yes, sir. We preach it in. <laughs> the universities are preaching it out, taking it out. And, and some of our kids, some of our kids are not, not um, prepared to deal with the, 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 the huge huge requirement of being able to um, stand on biblical truth and, and much to the, the uh, failure of church, of churches. See, the church is more, more than just music. It really is. And, and God knows music has a place. It has an, a phenomenal place in, in our worship. We worship God. But the main thrust of why we gather of why we assemble is to examine the text of Scripture, to know the Word of God. See, because I promise you, I promise you, now, now what a friend we have in Jesus is a powerful him. But you know what? You need to know what that text is that supports that, that, that song. See, because that song in and of itself, apart from the text, means nothing. But when Jesus said, I, I, I have, I'm your friend in, in the scripture. He says, I call you no more servants, but I call you my friend. See, it's, it's, the, it's the word of God that gives emphasis to every song. So what we do, what we do in church, our, our church is an educational system. We're, we're here to educate, to edify, to equip Believers and saints in the text of Scripture, so that so that you and I see what Paul is doing here in First Corinthians 15. He is building what's called an apologetic. What is an apologetic? The word apologia means this. Paul said, "I am um, set. I am ready for the defense of the gospel." The word defense is the word apologia. Paul said, "I I am ready to give a defense." of, of the, the truths of the gospel. And so what we want to do, we want to prepare our kids. We, you, you know what? It's great that, that they're going away to college, but you know what? They need to be prepared to what? Defend their faith. Not, not to trade it in for the soup. And, and so we, we, we labor, we want to labor at this. And, and, and we're, we're back at the drawing board here at Manor Man Bible. Um, relative to our, our youth ministry, we're, we're ever looking at it, trying to tweak it, trying to develop it. But, but we, we, we really want it in a place where, where we are confident that we're, we're dispensing truths, transformative truths, that will keep their minds. They, they need, see nothing, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you probably know this. When, when they get on college campuses, mom and dad, outside of the circle of mom and dad, mom and dad is the last thing that they're going to be thinking about when, when, when the soup comes, when, when the offer to go to a party comes, and, 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 and where they're challenged in, in what mom and dad has put in, put in them. See, what, what you want to do, I, I want to know that they are competent, competent in Scripture. If, if, if they can't sing a note, I want to know that they know the book. Do, do you know the book? 
that, that's, that's what's important. That's what's important uh, because uh, they're, they're, they're challenged in ways when I was growing up. See, when, when I was growing up, and that's quite a few years ago, um, if, if you weren't able to guess that. I, I know you can't perhaps see that right away, but I'm 58 years old. I never thought I'd see. I, I never thought about getting 60 or 58. I never thought what that would be like. Um, it, it's like my youth has, has just gone like a vapor. And bam, here I am. Wow. But, but um, I, th we, we were never confronted with, with these tremendous uh, pressures to conform in our thinking, the peer pressure. Um, all, all of the, the, the soup that's out there is just so much on, on our, our young uh, kids. And, and we, want, we want so badly for them to, to, um, to be able to, again, defend what is true. And, and that's what Paul is doing here in 1 Corinthians 15. He's developing for the Corinthians what's called an apologetic, a defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by this, he says, if Christ is preached that he, or since he's preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? See, there, there is a resurrection from the dead. Um, and if people continue to eat and the, the soup and, and drink the Kool-Aid, um, it leads to despair. Um, um, what, what's, what's that called? Um, the, the word um, nihilism, N-I-H-I-L-S-M, nihilism. N nihil is the Latin word for nothing means nothing. And, and nihilism is, is this place where, where, where people get, after they eat the soup, they finally get to a point and say, what's the point? If, if there's no absolute truth, then, then there's no morality. If there's no morality, I can do what I want. And if there's no morality, I can do what I want, then I don't have to answer to anybody. I don't have to answer to my parents. I don't have to answer to the police. I don't have to answer to my teachers. I don't have to answer to my boss. See, that, that leads to nihilism, nothing. And, and, and some people don't, don't do well with, with this nihilistic um, despair. Um, in, in fact, many, many, many kids, um, statistically, uh, kids in, in this age group, uh, 15 to 20, 24, um, that's the, the range in which the, in fact, if I were to ask you, what is the leading cause of death for that age group, 15 to 24, what is it? It's suicide. Now, that, that's incredible. The leading cause of death. Why? Because, because they've been drinking and eat, drinking the Kool-Aid, eating the soup. And they're confronted with, with nothing. They, they have nothing to, to depend on, nothing to look to, no hope. And, and, and this kind of, of junk will, will lead to, to despair. That's, that's why Paul um, is writing this um, about the gospel. Because the gospel, again, is, is earth's first and last best hope. <laughs> this is it. There's no plan B. There is no option, no alternative truth that, that will deliver and give this kind of hope. It is, it is Christ or perish. I hate to be that uh, frank, but it's true. And, and so when Paul says, if there is no resurrection... Now, now, what he does, he entertains this, this uh, thinking. Well, let's, let's entertain it. Let's just suppose. What if there is no resurrection? Then what? See, now, now here's, here's, where, here's where you and I um, are, are confronted and, and where we need to be able to reason our way through this. And, and listen, listen. Um, let me challenge you. Let me encourage you. 
And I, I pray that you, you're not offended by this. But God does not reward ignorance. There is no, when you get before God and, and you stand in his presence and he, he um, if you're expecting um, um, a reward, a, a, a job well done because you, you're ignorant, because you don't know, you're mistaken. In fact, I would suggest to you, it's just the opposite. <laughs> How do I know that? Because the scripture says that he has put teachers in the body. For what? So that you and I can know. And Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant, <laughs> brethren. So ignorance is, is not blissful. It, and in fact, it, it can be quite damaging and, and problematic for us. So let, don't, don't find a nice little niche where, where you think you're comfortable. You know what, <laughs> Pastor Keynes? You know what, man? I, I, I really don't need all of that. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of content with what I know. We see, therein lies, lies part of the problem for, for Christians and for the Christian church is that we, we, we tend, like the world, we tend, like the world, to dummy down um, um, uh, the values. You know what? Um, where where we, we say to our kids, we say to our kids, you know what? I, I, you know, I... I some of our schools are handing out condoms. Why? Be because they, they, they're not going to hold them to a standard. They, they'll say, well, just in case. No. No, there's no just in case. I expect that you will maintain your body and keep yourself for marriage. And I'm not giving you any, any escape clause or any, any, any possible. No, no. See, I think, I think we in the, in the church tend to dummy down and, and not hold our kids to high standards. And guess what? They can do this. They can, do, they can know this. They can learn. Just listen to how they, they, they learn. They learn that garbage rap. They, they, they can sing it backward and forward. They probably know every, every one of those artists out there. Yeah. But then you ask them, well, well what, what does the book of, of, of Nehemiah speak about? What's the main thrust of Nehemiah's message? See, see what I'm saying? We, 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 we want to hold them to a higher standard. We, we want to hold ourselves to a higher standard. You, you and I need to have high standards. Why? Because our God is a great God. And how dare you and I diminish what he has put in you and limit what he wants to do in you and through you. No, there's no limitations. Don't, don't you dare do that. Don't you dare take, um, take, take, take a, a hiatus when it comes to the study of the word of God. This, this is what we do. This is what we do as believers. And, and beloved, whether you believe it or not, whether you want to accept it or not, whether you want to do it or not, this, you need to do this. You, you absolutely need this. This, this is, is, is absolutely necessary and essential to your health, to your spiritual well-being. And in fact, without it, it's going to affect your emotional well-being. There are, there are a lot of us, there are a lot of us who are struggling with emotional stuff because the book isn't fixed in its proper place in our lives. That's, that's our only hope, beloved. That's, that's the message. See, see the implication for the, for, the, for the empty tomb? The implication for the empty tomb is, is that... Uh, and, and you see, you and I need to keep looking at that tomb. <laughs> keep, keep looking at the tomb. Keep, keep reading the gospel. What? He's, he's alive. Keep looking at that empty tomb. Why? Because, because the soup keeps coming. And, and, and experience keeps coming. And, 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 and one, one just, just, I mean, just this week, experience came my way. And, and, and I had to look again and reevaluate that empty tomb because it implies to me that there's hope. I, sh I should never, never despair and come to a point where of hopelessness. Why? Because I serve a risen Savior. Why? Because he's a God who raises dead people. <laughs> if he can raise the dead, what is it that he can't do in your life? There's nothing God can't do. But if you keep drinking that, that Kool-Aid, <laughs> eating that soup... Some, some of the scientists, some of the scientists try to explain, try to explain the resurrection. 
And, and, and some of the best theories, for instance, it's, it's the swoon theory. You've probably heard of it, where he wasn't actually dead. But, but that he, he swooned or went into a coma. And that three days later, he awoke and was strong enough to move the stone. <laughs> These are scientists. What does it imply? All right, if he swooned, then that means what? The Romans, who are trained killers. <laughs> They're trained in, in unmercifully putting you to death, impaling you on a cross, nails in your hands and in your feet, breaking your bones if necessary. And uh, apparently the Roman soldiers made a mistake. Beloved, see, scientists can't explain it, so don't, don't look to them, to scientists, to help you with your faith. Um, our, our faith is dependent upon revelation, the revelation of Scripture, the revelation of the Word of God. So when Paul says, um, if there is no resurrection, he's basically entertaining consequences, implications. First thing he says here, <laughs> if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty. Which basically, you know, it reminds me of this. That basically what Paul is saying here. Now, now go with me. Read it again. Look at the verse. Look at the verse. Look at the verse. Look at the verse. I hope you brought your Bible. I want you to look at it. I want you to look at the words. <laughs> I want you to see it. Paul says, and if, verse 14, 1 Corinthians 15, 14. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. You see, what Paul is doing here, he's basically saying that the centrality of preaching is about the resurrection. Do you see that? He, he associates the risen Savior with his preaching. See that? And he says, if he's not, if he's not raised, then I don't have anything to preach. Amen. Do you see that? That's, that's what he's saying. So preaching needs to find the centrality of its message in the risen Savior. And, and so that which does not center on the resurrection of Jesus, Paul would say, is not biblical preaching. And there's a lot of preaching going on. Amen. But the question is, is it biblical? Amen. See, biblical preaching finds its central theme in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And no matter what, our understanding, therefore, must be grounded in this truth that Christ is raised from the dead. Amen. There are all kinds of gospels out, out there floating in the soup, in the soup. There's, there's a social gospel. There's the uh, liberation theology gospel. There's the prosperity gospel. All kinds of gospels that, um, are, that, that soup and Kool-Aid that's out there. And it diminishes and distorts the, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, when when um, uh, Trayvon Martin was, was killed, um, it, it, it's tragic. It is tragic, beloved. And, and you, you and I know, uh, again, the, you know, the story. Um, and as, as I'm uh, watching, you and I, I I'm sure, watched uh, the news and the accounts of how it's happened, how it happened, and, and yada, yada, yada. Um, um, a old faithful, old faithful um, preachers come, come to the forefront. Um, the Jesse Jacksons um, and the Al Sharptons, yeah. all of them, um, and, and others that are, that are preachers. And, and I, I don't, I'm, I'm I guess what I'm, I'm saying here, I'm trying to say to you that we, we've not been called to, to uh, socially change or to change the, the, the social uh, 
discrimination, um, um, this, this issue, because that, that's really what, what they're trying to make it about. And, and I'm, I'm saddened by it, I'm, I'm, I'm disturbed by it, the implications, yes, if, if he did it, if, if Zimmerman killed him just because he was a black man, I, that, that disturbs me. But, but you know what, I, I'm so bothered by, by this because in, in the midst of, of, of this, this issue, here um, Trayvon was killed by this, this, this uh, white man. Um, and, and I use those terms just because that's the story right now, and that's how they're playing the story. But, but you know what? There are Trayvons who are being killed every day, every day in the African-American community. And you just, you just don't hear from the Jesses and the Owls. Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? You see, what, what they have here is, is what they believe is, is something that's going to embolden them, that puts them out front um, again. But, but see, I, I think, again, what we want to do as, as preachers of the gospel, what we want to do is bring hope. How, what's, what's, what's the, what, uh, okay, so, so he did it. Let, let's say, let's assume the worst. What is the worst? Is that, that yes, this, that we're still faced here in America with dis discrimination and prejudice. All right, fine. But what is the hope? What's going to change that? Speak to me. What will fix that? And all I know is that the gospel of Jesus Christ, we serve a God who can change and transform lives and minds. That's, that's what I'm trying to say here, um, that, that we don't want to get so in, um, bogged down in, in that kind of uh, social issue. Um, well, take, for instance, the same-sex uh, marriage, that issue. We, 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 again, stand on, on the word of God and we preach it from what? The context of, of what the Bible says relative to marriage. What the Bible de de determines is, is truth relative to marriage. So, so the basis for, for our preaching, for our stance, is clearly um, weaved from the message of the word of God. And I'm just saying that when, when we come up with social gospel, um, black liberation, the, see, the word of God, the gospel wasn't written to liberate blacks from, from, um, from, from bondage. Now, hear me, hear me, hear me, lest, lest you go thinking that I'm, I'm, uh, um, I'm a little loose uh, in, in my thinking. I, the, the gospel wasn't written to liberate us from, from slavery. The gospel is to liberate us from our sin. That is lost in the message of liberation theology. They would think, you would think that once you're liberated socially, then everything is fine. No. In fact, if you're not liberated in, from your sin, you're, you're just going to mess up whatever um, good is going to happen socially. What's wrong with our culture is sin. Whether it's discrimination or whether it's, it's hatred, it's sin, beloved. And the only hope for our world, for our culture, for our people is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only hope. And, and I, I just want to make sure that, that we're, we're understanding this and we need to speak to that when, when confronted. We, we preach a gospel that says uh, Christ can save us and deliver us from the worst of conditions. So our preaching is vain. It's empty. It's, it has no purpose. And so it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder. Preaching is, is so, so vital. So vital. Preaching and teaching the word of God is so vital. And it just makes me wonder, why, why is it that the vast majority, and in fact, um, George Bonner, um, he's always doing studies and, and about uh, Christian um, statistics, people attending church, um, people uh, reading Bibles, and, 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 and over, over the ages, over the years, since the beginning of the postmodern era and the age, there has been a, a, a precipitous decline in church attendance, in a, a, a decline in Bible reading. And, and how do you, how do you uh, 
um, reconcile these. Where, where Paul says, since Christ is raised, how is it that some of you say there is no resurrection? Uh, how do we reconcile this? I, I would suggest to you that the decline is because people are eating the, the soup and, and we've not, we've not um, embraced the, the teaching and the preaching of the word of God as being all that important, all that essential. And that's just part of the soup because the soup and the, the, the Kool-Aid is designed to minimize the value of spiritual things. Amen and to, to accentuate the value of physical things. That's, that's what this world is all about. Getting what you can, sitting back and enjoying it, living the life, the American dream, but there's no, no challenge relative to the things of the spirit. And, and so um, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of, of Christ from the dead has profound implications for your life and for my life. We're, we're going to pick this up next week.